War on the Lakes, Naval War of 1812 Illustrated. A production of the American Society of Marine Artists. Part three, War on the Lakes. British North America, what we know as Canada today, was sparsely populated in the opening years of the 19th century. The population was about one-tenth the size found in the United States, but, like much of America, was found in small settlements, some of which were fortified. Amherstburg was typical. It was located on the Detroit River at the western end of Lake Erie. Across the river, on the American side in the Michigan part of the Northwest Territory, was another fortified outpost, Detroit. Access to rivers and lakes was key, for there were few roads and most trade and supplies moved over water. The British had strategic alliances with their local Native American tribes that dated back to the French and Indian War of 1756 through 1763, whereas the Americans, constantly pressing west into Native American lands, had much more contentious relationships. The tribes were not isolated entities, but were often allied or federated with other tribes on either side of the border. Moreover, some outstanding and visionary Native American leaders influenced tribes throughout the western frontier, from the Gulf of Mexico to what is now northern Ontario. One such was Tecumseh. He was closely allied with the British who supplied him and his allies with arms and ammunition. Americans in the frontier west, the Northwest Territory, and frontier south, the Mississippi Territory, often felt the consequence of this arrangement and they seized upon the maritime conflict of the coastal states with the British as a way to address their own needs. American thinking about British North America prior to the opening of war could be found in four schools of thought. One, merely threatening to invade Canada, a place very difficult for the British to defend, would bring the British to their senses about their abuses of American maritime rights. Two, if the threat did not work, invading and holding the thinly populated Upper Canada, present-day Ontario, would provide a stronger bargaining chip at the negotiating table. Three, the British threat to America's northern border and its troubling relationship with Native American tribes could be eliminated entirely if the British were driven out and Canada, or at least Upper Canada, became part of the United States. And four, there was the even more naive notion that the Canadians would welcome American liberation from the tyranny of the British Crown. Naive, especially because many American loyalists had fled to Upper Canada during and after the Revolutionary War. In the early 19th century, the border the United States shared with British North America, Canada, was made up of impenetrable forests but running through them from the Atlantic to the middle of the continent was a water necklace that served both as a natural border between the two countries as well as the best means of transportation. Much of this necklace is made up of the St. Lawrence River that drains the Great Lakes and flows from the west to the east, emptying into the Atlantic Ocean at the Gulf of St. Lawrence. If one started there and headed west, or up, the river for 300 miles, one would first come to Quebec. 200 miles farther, one would find the town of Sorrel Tracy, situated at the mouth of the Richelieu River that is fed by waters flowing north from Lake Champlain. Continuing westward another 80 miles on the St. Lawrence brings one to Montreal, and 175 more to Lake Ontario. Across it, one would continue up the Niagara River around Niagara Falls into Lake Erie and across it to the Detroit River on up to Lake Huron and to Lakes Michigan and Superior. These last three far distant lakes did not figure significantly in the War of 1812, although one of the first victories for the British and their Native American allies was the July 17th surprise raid and capture of Fort Mackinac now pronounced Fort Mackinac, an American trading post located where Lake Huron meets Lake Michigan, a position they would hold until the end of the war. But from a military point of view, the three key theaters were Lake Erie, 
where the Americans hoped to invade the sparsely populated Upper Canada from Fort Detroit, the Niagara River and Lake Ontario, and potentially the most dangerous for the Americans, Lake Champlain, which, when combined with the St. Lawrence River, offered a waterway from the more populated part of the British colony directly south into New England. Lake Erie, 1812. When the war began in June, 1812, the U.S. Navy's presence on the Great Lakes bordered on non-existent. It had no ships on Lake Erie, although American forces had fitted out the U.S. Army Brig Adam 6 at Fort Detroit on the western end of the lake. The British, on the other hand, had the Sloop of War Queen Charlotte 17 and the Brig General Hunter 10, and some lesser vessels including the Caledonia 2. The Brig Lady Prevost 13 under construction would soon join them. These were part of the Provincial Marine, more of a military transport service than a naval one, manned by local, not Royal Navy, sailors. Nonetheless, the British seized control of Lake Erie as soon as the war began. The American Brigadier General William Hull, governor of the Michigan Territory and Revolutionary War hero, was ordered to invade Canada from Fort Detroit. He went to Ohio and gathered 2,000 regular and militia troops and marched across the Ohio wilderness to Fort Detroit. He knew his supply lines back to Ohio overland were in jeopardy and those over Lake Erie virtually non-existent because of the British control of the lake. The hope was that a quick strike and the capture of Upper Canada would make the British naval control of Lake Erie irrelevant and short-lived. But Hull was right to be concerned about the importance of sea lanes, for when his army reached Fort Detroit in the Michigan Territory on July 5th, they found no supplies, and the only U.S. maritime force on the lake, the U.S. Brig Adam 6, incapacitated and under repair. Meanwhile, Hull's land supplies were intercepted, and on July 2nd, the Provincial Marine Brig General Hunter captured the American schooner Cuyahoga in which Hull had shipped much of his important war material to lighten his march to Detroit. Nonetheless, on July 12th, Hull crossed the Detroit River into Canada, made his famous proclamation that he had come to liberate the inhabitants, most of whom did not seem appreciative of his offer. Not having artillery, Hull did not attack the defending British fort, but returned back across the Detroit River. Worse yet, the seasoned and highly respected British Major General Isaac Brock, who was in charge of the military in Upper Canada, had learned about Hull's army in Fort Detroit and its general condition, and marched to put an end to this threat. Playing on the known weakness of the American situation at Fort Detroit and knowing America's fear of Native American savages, a good number of whom were with Brock under Chief Tecumseh, Brock crossed the River Detroit and laid siege to the fort. He then orchestrated a masterful deception and convinced Hull on August 16th to abandon his hopeless situation in order to avoid the savagery of the Native Americans whose bloodlust he might not be able to control. Hull surrendered with his entire army and with the prizes of war went the U.S. Army Brig Adams, then renamed Provincial Marine Brig Detroit, this victory greatly strengthened the British hold on the lake and not only prevented an American invasion along the western border, but also put in jeopardy American forts in the Northwest Territory. Daniel Dobbins was a colorful and successful merchant who bought salt from mines in New York and transported and sold it throughout the Northwestern region via Lake Erie and Lake Huron on his ship, the Salina. But twice at the beginning of the war, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and twice the British captured him. First, he was taken on July 17th when the British surprised the Americans, who did not know the war had been declared, at Fort Mackinac. He extricated himself from that, only to stop at Fort Detroit on his way home to Presque Island, Erie, just when it was taken by the British.
But again, he escaped and brought news of both British victories to his poorly defended hometown. Alarmed that Presque Island, Erie, would be the next to fall to the British, and at the urging of the local militia, Dobbins made a long trip to Washington to meet with President Madison and the Navy Department to plead for a strong naval presence on Lake Erie. After debate as to the best location to build ships in the wilderness of Lake Erie, Prescott Island was chosen. It was a natural harbor and sandbar that would protect the harbor from deep draft warships and was within reasonable proximity of the manufacturing frontier town of Pittsburgh, some miles to the south. Dobbins was made a captain in the Navy, ordered to return to Prescott Island and build four ships and given funds to do so. He brought with him the shipwright Ebenezer Crosby, and together they began to turn wilderness forests into warships. Fully appreciative of the importance naval control of the lakes in determining the outcome of the war, the Navy was already moving on other fronts and had ordered Captain Isaac Chauncey to leave the Navy Yard in New York City and report immediately to the Naval Station at Sackett's Harbor on Lake Ontario, where he was to build a commanding naval presence to take control of the upper lakes. Chauncey, in turn, learned about a young Navy officer in Rhode Island who had requested a transfer from a command of gunboats there to the lakes. Oliver Hazard Perry, son of a Navy captain, had become a Navy midshipman at the age of 13 and had seen duty in the quasi-war with France and the Barbary War. He was just what Chauncey wanted, an experienced, energetic, good administrator officer looking for action. Chauncey put Perry in charge of naval activity on Lake Erie. Lake Ontario, 1812. The only naval vessel the Americans had on Lake Ontario upon the declaration of war was the U.S. brig Oneida, 16, but it was under the command of Lieutenant Melanchthon Taylor Woolsey and had an experienced crew. It was based in Sackett's Harbor, a weakly defended base at the eastern end of Lake Ontario in northern New York where the lake waters begin to flow into the St. Lawrence River. To the north, across the lake, was the Kingston Provincial Marine Naval Dockyard where the Provincial Marine had an impressive fleet of six ships, including PM Sloop of War Royal George 22, PM Sloop of War Prince Regent 16, PM Brig Earl of Moira 14, PM Brig Duke of Gloucester 10, PM Schooner Seneca 8, and PM Schooner Simcoe 8 all under Master and Commander Hugh Earle. But they were crewed by much less experienced men. In early July 1812, Lieutenant Woolsey complained to his superiors about the lopsided situation. And, as if to underscore his point, the ships of the Provincial Marine attacked Sackett's Harbor on July 19th. However, Woolsey was able to fend them off. This only confirmed the British conviction that they too needed to strengthen their naval presence. What ensued was the first naval arms race in United States history, the Battle of the Carpenters. As an immediate first step, Lieutenant Woolsey was ordered to buy six schooners to convert into warships. These were the U.S. schooners Hamilton, 10, Governor Tompkins, 8, Conquest, 6, Growler, 2, Julia, 2, and Pert, 1. On September 3rd, the Navy placed Captain Isaac Chauncey in command of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Chauncey's shipbuilding experience at the New York Navy Yard was important, as his first task at Sackett's Harbor was to build a substantial fleet that he was to command, a task complicated by its remote location far from the naval stores of the Atlantic coast. While American supplies in the east were a great deal closer to the Great Lakes as the bird flies than were the British supplies at their major naval station at Halifax, Nova Scotia, water transport made it much easier for the British. 
the Americans had to drag materials and guns across New York State through the Mohawk Valley wilderness, the future site of the Erie Canal, or cannon up from the Chesapeake Bay. Moreover, seasoned timber did not exist in the region, forcing Chauncey to build with green lumber. Despite these difficulties Chauncey faced on Lake Ontario and Perry faced on Lake Erie, they enlisted hundreds of men in their efforts, including Navy sailors and Marines, carpenters and shipwrights, along with the leading naval New York architects Adam and Noah Brown and Henry Eckford. They made do with what they had, replacing iron nails with tree nails or trunnels, and used lead, which was available from mines in the West, to replace oakum for caulking and pig iron for ballast. Under Chauncey's direction, they laid down the keel for the U.S. Corvette Madison 24 and purchased four more ships and armed them with cannon. The U.S. schooners Ontario 2, Scourge 9, Fair American 2, and Asp 1. Designed to work rivers and harbors, these trading schooners had shallow drafts unlike their deeper keeled ocean counterparts. As a consequence, once armed with heavy cannon, they tended to be top-heavy and were generally poor sailors, aspects that would constantly hamper the efficiency of the American fleet. Before the winter closed the lake, Commodore Chauncey took the U.S. brig Oneida and some other of his ships to attack Kingston on November 6, but it was inconsequential and called off when the single cannon exploded on the U.S. schooner Pert. Of much greater significance was the decisive defeat of what was to have been the second prong of the American invasion of Canada across the Niagara River upstream from where it flows into the western part of Lake Ontario. The first prong was Hull's unsuccessful attempt from Fort Detroit across the Detroit River at the western end of Lake Erie three months earlier. The Americans, under Major General Stephen Van Rensler, crossed the Niagara River to take Queenston on October 13th, but were repulsed and lost more than a thousand men captured, wounded, or killed at a cost of over a hundred defenders. But one of the dead at the Battle of Queenstown Heights was the venerated British Major General Isaac Brock, a competent administrator and general. He became one of the great heroes in Canadian history and was memorialized with a large monument raised to his memory in 1824, depicted here by the American artist Thomas Cole. Meanwhile, on Lake Ontario, the British laid down keels for two 24-gun ships, the PM Sloop of War Wolf, to be built in Kingston, and the PM Sloop of War Isaac Brock, to be constructed at the western end of the lake in York, now Toronto. The year 1813 began with a change in British leadership on Lake Ontario when Royal Navy Captain James Lucas Yeo and seasoned Royal Navy officers arrived to replace Provincial Marine Master and Commander Hugh Earl. At this point in time, the Americans intended to launch another prong of their strategy to take Canada. The plan was to use several thousand troops of the Army under Major General Henry Dearborn in conjunction with Commodore Chauncey's growing naval strength to attack and take the Kingston Royal Navy Yard, and then attack York and Fort George at the mouth of the Niagara River. This would give a significant, if not decisive, strategic advantage to the Americans in Upper Canada. But faulty intelligence led the Americans to believe Kingston had been greatly reinforced so they reversed the plan and Commodore Chauncey sailed west with his fleet along with Dearborn's troops and an amphibious force under the explorer Brigadier General Zebulon Pike to capture York. The coordinated land-sea attack on April 27th went well for the Americans. Retreating and cutting their losses, the British set fire to the PM Sloop of War Isaac Brock, 24, under construction and also the fort's magazine. When the latter exploded, it killed General Pike and caused nearly 250 of the total 320 American casualties. In the battle, the British lost 475 killed, wounded or captured. 
Although peace was negotiated, the Americans burned the public buildings and plundered much of the town, contrary to orders from General Dearborn. The consequences would be costly for the Americans later on their own soil. In keeping with their plan, the Americans sailed south and took Fort George in another successful joint Army-Navy amphibious attack on May 25th. Since the British believed the entire line of their forts along the Canadian side of the Niagara River were vulnerable following the loss of Fort George, they evacuated them and regrouped to the west while the Americans occupied them. In the course of the summer and fall, the British Army mounted successful counterattacks at Stony Creek, June 5th, and the Battle of Beaver Dams, June 24th. The success at the latter is attributed to Laura Secord, whose husband was still recovering from wounds at the Battle of Queensland Heights months before, and who walked through 12 miles of unfamiliar and dangerous territory to warn the British the Americans were coming. She became a national heroine and, along with General Brock, a symbol of Canadian determination to resist American aggression. As the British regrouped on land, the Americans retreated, eventually abandoning all of the captured forts along the Canadian side of the Niagara River. The year ended little different than how it began. Meanwhile, back on the naval front, news of the fall of Fort George and York reached Kingston, where visiting Commander-in-Chief Prevost and Commodore Yeo decided to attack Sackett's Harbor while the American forces were occupied in the western part of the lake. On May 27th, British troops and ships set sail and arrived the next morning, but the assault was delayed by the unexpected arrival of a flotilla of boats carrying American soldiers to Sackett's Harbor. While the British dealt with them, killing or capturing most, it gave the Americans time to rally militia and strengthen defenses to the point where the British eventually aborted the attack and returned to Kingston. Casualties totaled just under 600 killed, wounded or captured, roughly divided equally between the warring parties. Strategically, the Americans set fire to the U.S. Corvette General Pike, 28, still on the ways, fearing it would fall to the British. But when the British suddenly left, the fire was put out, and because the ship was built with green wood, out of necessity, the fire damage was limited. She was launched June 12th, tipping the balance of firepower in favor of the Americans for a while. During the rest of the year on Lake Ontario, there were a number of skirmishes, none of which were strategically significant, but all of which demonstrated the caution the commanders of both navies exercise lest they lose ships and give the command of the lake to the other party. The first was an encounter on August 10th, two days after the U.S. schooners Scourge 9 and Hamilton 10 capsized while at anchor in a sudden night squall with the loss of most of the men aboard. The squadrons of the two adversaries met in a battle formation and two American schooners, the Groller 2 and the Asp 1, failed to wear or turn with their fleet and were cut off and captured by the British. Another less consequential encounter was an ineffectual distant engagement off the mouth of the Genesee River east of Niagara on September 11th. But a more memorable one that has come down through history as the Burlington Races occurred in York Bay on September 28th when Commodore Yeo and his flagship, the PM Sloop of War Wolf 24, and a number of vessels in his squadron met Chauncey in his flagship U.S. Sloop of War General Pike 28 and the U.S. Corvette President Madison 24 and the U.S. Schooner Sylph 12, each towing one of the slow-sailing armed schooners. They briefly dueled during rising weather. While the General Pike was damaged, the Wolf lost its mizzen mass and main top mass and dramatically beat down wind in a gale for an hour and a half to escape the pursuing Americans. Chauncey, slowed by the dullard schooners he was towing and fearful of being driven onto a lee shore that was controlled by the enemy, called off the pursuit and Yo anchored safely in Burlington Bay. 
The final incident occurred while the Americans unsuccessfully attempted to mount another planned prong of the invasion of Canada, namely attacking Montreal with forces in Sackett's Harbor under General James Wilkinson, plus American forces coming up the St. Lawrence from Plattsburgh on Lake Champlain under General Hampton. Personalities, Wilkinson and Hampton hated each other, Poor leadership, illness, adverse weather and poor communications frustrated and doomed the effort, but not before the Americans disembarked from Sackett's Harbor and from Plattsburgh. Seasonal rough weather had weakened the blockade of Kingston, and a British force under Colonel Joseph Morrison slipped out aboard H.M. schooners Beresford and Sidney Smith under Captain William Mulcaster. Although only a tenth the size of the American army, they surprised the Americans at John Chrysler's farm near Morrisburg on the Canadian side of the river on November 11th and forced them to retreat in disarray to the American side. The plan to attack Montreal from Sackett's Harbor had been frustrated and the Americans took up winter quarters downstream at French Mills. Lake Erie, 1813. In the fall of 1812, American Commodore Isaac Chauncey, newly charged with responsibility for all naval activities on Lakes Ontario and Erie, appointed Lieutenant Jesse Duncan Elliott to acquire four vessels to be converted into warships for the Lake Erie fleet. Elliott went to Buffalo at the eastern end of Lake Erie and across the Niagara River from the British Fort Erie and began to buy vessels. But in early October 1812, two brigs, the PM Brig Detroit and the PM Brig Caledonia, dropped anchor under the guns of Fort Erie. Elliot thought these vessels would provide an excellent addition to the new American fleet at Lake Erie if they could be cut out and brought over to the protection of American guns. He conferred with Colonel Winfield J. Scott who was based with the U.S. Army, 2nd Artillery in Buffalo, and with the approval of Scott's commander, Captain Nathan Tosin, they hatched a plan. In the dead of night on October 9th, take two scows with muffled oars and dozens of men, many from the 2nd Artillery, cross the Niagara River and surprise and overwhelm the crews of the two brigs. It worked. The captured Caledonia reached the American side safely, but the captured Detroit, got caught in the current of the river, ran aground, and, after frustrating British attempts to retake it, the Americans unloaded considerable munitions and ammunition from her, then burned the vessel. Within months, the British built a bigger Detroit, and that would be their flagship in the Battle of Lake Erie 11 months later, almost to the day. Lieutenant Elliott's new fleet was effectively blockaded by the guns of Fort Erie until the Americans took Fort George on May 24, 1813, and the British abandoned all fortifications on their side of the river, including Fort Erie. At that point, Elliott and a couple hundred men and several teams of oxen towed the five vessels up the Niagara River and into Lake Erie, where they sailed safely to Prescott Isle. The five were the captured U.S. Brig Caledonia 3, U.S. schooners Summers 2, Tigris 1, and Ohio 1, and U.S. Sloop Trippy 1. When they arrived at Prescott Isle, they found Commodore Perry in full swing. He had arrived with his brother Alexander in the late winter and had taken on his new responsibility with a remarkable energy and sense of urgency. Along with the imported shipwrights, naval architects, and shipbuilders, they had built three schooners, the Ariel 4, Scorpion 2, and the Porcupine 1, and had laid keels for two large, identical 20-gun brigs, the Lawrence and the Niagara. Across the lake, the British, under the one-armed Captain Robert Harriet Barclay, a seasoned officer who served with Admiral Nelson in the Battle of Trafalgar, oversaw a similar effort in Amherstburg, Fort Malden, to build a fleet in the wilderness. His logistics were no better, and one could argue considerably worse, than those of the Americans, but nonetheless they assembled a fleet of six ships, including the three large ones that, on a tonnage basis, more or less matched the three largest American ships, HM Sloop of War Detroit 20, 
HM Sloop of War Queen Charlotte, 18, and HM Schooner Lady Prevost, 14. They also had the HM Brig Hunter, 10, HM Schooner Chippeway, 1, and the HM Sloop Little Belt, 3. These ships, with the exception of the American ship Ohio that had been sent on another mission, made up the two fleets in the Battle of Lake Erie, the first fleet engagement in the history of the U.S. Navy. Time was another enemy for Captain Barclay, for provisions at his base were running low and resupplying them was increasingly threatened by the American naval presence on the lake. Moreover, the British were feeding thousands of Native American allies camped at Fort Malden, Amherstburg, who would disband if food were cut off. To ready the Detroit for battle, in the absence of naval cannon, they equipped her with cannon taken from Fort Malden, but these had to be fired by igniting their touch holes with pistol fire. So armed, they sailed out to meet the Americans. In just about every way, the American fleet was larger. Number of vessels, 9 versus 6. Tonnage, 1,691 versus 1,460. And number of crew, approximately 530 versus 440. Although the British carried more cannon, 66 versus 54, the broadside weight of the American guns was nearly 2 to 1, 936 pounds versus 469 pounds, and importantly, the Americans had very heavy long guns mounted on their smaller vessels, a real asset in light airs, as would be the case in the Battle of Lake Erie. Americans, two long 32-pounders and four long 24-pounders versus the British, no 32 longs and only two 24 longs. Noteworthy in terms of understanding the battle tactics, both American brigs were armed primarily with carronades, deadly but short-range weapons, whereas their British counterparts were more evenly balanced between carronades and long guns. The very sandbar lying six feet below the entrance to Prescott Isle Harbor that protected Erie from large warships was, of course, a real problem when it came to getting large ships built there out of the harbor and into the lake. The solution was known from the beginning, but there was a twist that could have prevented success. Once ready for sea, they would camel the new brigs over the hump of the bar. This involved placing special barges along either side of the ship, running large timbers from one barge to the other through the fore and aft gun ports of the brig, opening seacocks to flood and lower the barges, blocking up the ends of the large timbers on the barge decks, closing the seacocks and pumping out the water and thereby lift the brig and lessen its draft. Once over the bar, the camel's hump, the process would be reversed. The fly in the ointment was the fact that to lighten the brig as much as possible, her guns had to be unloaded, thereby making her defenseless during the hour's long procedure. This was not a problem unless the enemy was sitting outside the harbor waiting for the camel process to begin. And, of course, the British were, and they maintained a blockade watch constantly until August 4th, when they inexplicably disappeared. Jumping on the opportunity, Perry brought his flagship, the Lawrence, to the bar and began the camel process that afternoon. It took longer than anticipated since the brig drew too much water and the camel process had to be done twice. But by daybreak, she was across and rearmed. At that time, the British reappeared, but it was too late. After some exchange of fire, they withdrew and the Niagara cameled the bar with no problem. The American superiority on Lake Erie was no longer theoretical. After the American brigs passed the bar, Master Commandant Perry spent a couple of weeks on a shakedown cruise during which he trained his men. Manpower was in short supply. He was unable to get any from his commanding officer, Commodore Chauncey, on Lake Ontario, so he turned to General Harrison in charge of the army in the Lake Erie region. He gave him any men who had sea experience plus about a hundred Kentucky sharpshooters who went on board as Marines. Ready for action, Perry took his fleet to Put-In Bay on the western side of the lake where he waited for Captain Barclay to sail out. 
On September 9th, he led his fleet of six ships out onto the lake, and in the morning of the next day, the Americans spotted them. The winds were fickle, but gave the Americans the weather gauge. Both fleets assembled in battle formation with the American Ariel and Scorpion leading the Lawrence down to engage the first of the British ships, the Chippeway, Detroit, Hunter, and Queen Charlotte. The other vessels of both fleets followed their respective flagships. At 11.45, the morning of September 10th, the Detroit opened with a shot from a long 24-pounder, but it fell short. Five minutes later, a second struck home, tearing through the Lawrence, and the Scorpion replied with its long 32-pounder, thus initiating general long gun action. It took many minutes for the Lawrence to get within range to use most of her guns, the 18 32-pound carronades, and all the while she took concentrated long gun fire from the Detroit and Chippeway. Meanwhile, ships in the aft part of the respective columns engaged in long gun duels until the American Caledonia and British Hunter came into the main fray to aid their respective flagships, while the American Niagara, under Master Commandant Elliot, whose battery consisted mostly of short-range carronades, remained out of range of the action. With this exception, both sides fought well and valiantly, and the carnage in the thick of action was considerable. It was made all the more horrific because the shallow draft of these vessels designed for the lakes provided no deck space below the waterline where surgeons could more safely operate and care for the wounded like in most blue water warships. Thus, they were exposed to the real killer in wooden warships, a barrage of splinters, large sharp slivers of wood that exploded inward on the men when a cannonball penetrated the hull. Yet out of this ward room on the Lawrence came wounded who responded to Perry's call for help back on deck. This continued until Perry, with the assistance of the chaplain and the purser, fired the last cannon. Four out of every five men Perry started the battle with on the Lawrence were dead or wounded. She was a floating but demolished wreck. Perry reordered the line of battle for his ships and took four men and his brother Alexander in a rowboat and transferred his flag to the untouched Niagara. As the firing ceased on the Lawrence, the British thought the Americans had capitulated. Soon they did, and even though there were only 14 men left standing on the Lawrence, the British were unable to take possession of the ship because their own ships were so damaged and because the Caledonia placed itself between the British and the drifting Lawrence. Upon taking command of the Niagara, Perry sent Master Commandant Elliot astern to bring the three American schooners in a closer formation. At 2.45, he led this squadron back to the center of the battle to sever Barclay's line. As he crossed it, he raked the British ships on both sides with devastating broadsides. Heavily damaged and unmaneuverable, the Detroit and Queen Charlotte fell afoul of each other. Captain Barclay realized the situation was hopeless and struck his colors at 3 p.m., three hours and 15 minutes after he had begun the fight. The Chippeway and Little Belt tried to escape but were overtaken and captured by the Scorpion and the Trippy. Captain Perry scribed a report of the battle that only added to his legend. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner and one sloop. The American fleet suffered greatly, especially on board the Lawrence, which accounted for two-thirds of the 123 casualties. 27 had been killed and 96 wounded, three of whom died. The British had 135 casualties, 41 killed and 94 wounded. The first and second in command of every British ship was either killed or wounded, a testimony to their valor. Theodore Roosevelt, in his first of 38 books, the Naval War of 1812, a book written in 1882 that would figure into rethinking global naval strategy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, examined each battle of that war from every angle, the size and makeup of weapon strength, ship design, seamanship and crew training, leadership, strategy and tactics, courage, etc. About this battle he wrote, the British ships were fought as resolutely as their antagonists, not being surrendered until they were crippled and helpless. Perry's two brigs were more than a match for the whole British squadron. In short, 
Our victory was due to our heavy metal. As regards the honor of the affair, in spite of the amount of American boasting it has given rise to, I should say it was a battle to be looked upon as in an equally high degree creditable to both sides. Captain Perry showed indomitable pluck and readiness to adapt himself to circumstances, but his claim to fame rests much less on his actual victory than on the way in which he prepared the fleet that was to win it. Here, his energy and activity deserve all praise, not only for his success in collecting sailors and vessels and in building the two brigs, but above all, for the manner in which he succeeded in getting them out on the lake. To underscore Roosevelt's praise of the man, Perry was 27 when he arrived to take naval command of Lake Erie and 28 when he won the Battle of Lake Erie. The consequences of the Battle of Lake Erie were most significant. During the summer of 1813, while the British still had a naval presence to protect their supply lines, General Henry Proctor's army and Tecumseh and his Native American warriors lay siege in May to Fort Miggs, a well-designed earthen and timber fortification built on the Maumee Rapids in Ohio under the direction of Eliezer Wood, one of the first graduates from West Point. Despite heavy pounding, the siege failed, although many from a Kentucky relief force were killed and captured by the British. Proctor and Tecumseh tried again in July, but again the fort withstood the attack. So in August, they sent some of their force to attack Fort Stevenson on the Sandusky River. But this too held, so they returned to Canada, much to the objection of Tecumseh, who urged the British to fight on. When the British lost control of Lake Erie in September, General Proctor knew he had to withdraw from positions he had held, but which could no longer be defended without logistical support over the lake. Thus, he abandoned Fort Detroit and even Fort Malden on his own soil and retreated to the interior up the Thames River. Perry repaired his now larger fleet and transported General Harrison's troops to the western end of the lake, where they were joined by a large force from Kentucky and Ohio. Harrison led his army of over 5,000 to reoccupy Fort Detroit, take over the abandoned Fort Malden, and pursue General Proctor and Tecumseh. The latter made a stand at Moravian Town. Harrison gave approval to Congressman Richard M. Johnson and his well-trained cavalry of 1,200 horsemen armed with muskets, not sabers, to mount a frontal assault through the woods. The unusual spectacle unnerved the defenders who were caught in a crossfire once the mounts broke through their lines. They surrendered, but Tecumseh's warriors vanished once they learned their chief had been killed. Importantly, this was the end of the British-Indian alliance that had been so significant and the end of the British threat to the American Northwestern Territories. Lake Champlain, 1813. In the book, The Naval War of 1812, Theodore Roosevelt stated what historians had echoed since that book was published 130 years ago about Thomas McDonough, the U.S. Navy Commodore in charge of Lake Champlain. It will always be a source of surprise that the American public should have so glorified Perry's victory over an inferior force and have paid comparatively little attention to McDonough's victory, which really was won against decided odds in ships, men, and metal. Lake Erie teaches us the advantage of having the odds on our side, Lake Champlain, that even if they are not, skill can counteract them. In the spring, the Americans controlled Lake Champlain, the vital north-south avenue from Canada into the heart of New York. The Richelieu River connected the St. Lawrence River to the lake and the Hudson River provided water access to the south to Albany and New York City. 29-year-old Lieutenant Thomas McDonough, who had fought in the Barbary War with distinction, had superseded the former commander of Lake Champlain, Lieutenant Sidney Smith, who now reported to him. In June, McDonough sent his naval force, consisting of the U.S. Sloop Scrawler 11, an Eagle 11, and six galleys mounting one gun each under Lieutenant Smith up the lake to where it emptied into the Richelieu River to harass the fleet of gunboats the British had kept at their fort at Isle-aux-Noirs. 
Unfortunately for Smith, he pursued the gunboats too close to the fort and the wind gave out making it impossible to escape the current of the north flowing river. After some considerable struggle, the sloops were taken and the naval power balance on this strategically important body of water shifted in favor of the British. But much like on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, both nations were building ships as fast as they could to take and hold more securely control of Lake Champlain. The grand invasion scheme the Americans had of sending an army from Plattsburgh, the town on the western side of Lake Champlain, north to join other American forces stationed on Lake Ontario to attack Montreal that summer fall, failed to materialize for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the naval reversal that enabled the British to block the natural route up the Richelieu River to the St. Lawrence River and Montreal. Instead, the American Army under Major General Wade Hampton decided to march west from Plattsburgh to the Chautauqua River that provided another route north, but was repulsed by Lieutenant Charles D. Solibury on October 26 at the Battle of Chautauqua. The British had successfully prevented the American attack on Montreal. In 1814, it was the British turn to attack the United States. Lake Champlain, 1814. With the Napoleonic War coming to a close in Europe, seasoned troops were available to be dedicated to the North American theater, and the Governor General of Canada, Lieutenant General Sir George Prevost, was able to assemble an army of 12,000 to go down Lake Champlain, invade New York, and take Plattsburgh. But, aware of the importance of protecting his long supply lines and protecting his flanks, Prevost waited until the British on Lake Champlain had built a fleet superior to the one the Americans, under Commodore McDonough, were building at Plattsburgh. The British squadron, under Captain George Downey, had recently launched the largest ship on the lake, almost a blue water frigate, the Confiance 37, of 1,200 tons, boasting 30 long 24-pounders on the gun deck, and on the foredeck, a swivel carriage long 24 pounder and six 32 pound carronades. It even had a furnace for hotshot and was and still is the largest warship ever built on that lake. At the urging of General Prevost, she was rushed into battle not yet fully completed. In addition to the two American sloops taken the year before, renamed the Chubb and Finch, Downey had the new HM Brig Linnet 16, launched in April and 12 gunboats, each armed with cannon. McDonough had to fight to get resources and men to build his fleet. Frustrated that Commodore Isaac Chauncey, in charge of the Great Lakes Naval Forces, would not release any to the Lake Champlain effort, McDonough sent his second-in-command to visit the Secretary of the Navy and as a result got the famous naval architect Noah Brown back from Chauncey and began building in earnest. The results were the 734-ton U.S. Sloop of War Saratoga 26, armed with eight 24-long cannon, 12 32-pound carronades, and six 42-pound carronades. The U.S. Brig Eagle 20, with eight long cannon and 12 32-pound carronades. U.S. Schooner Ticonderoga 17, the U.S. Sloop Preble 7, and gunboats, each mounting a 24 or 18 pound long cannon. A comparison of the two fleets, technically, would slightly favor the British in terms of tonnage, number of crew, and broadside weight. Although what counted about the latter was the relative strength in long guns, the British, versus the short-range carronades, the Americans. The number of vessels was also approximately evenly matched, but the size of the Confiance was a distinct advantage for the British. McDonough coolly formulated his strategy, having weighed all aspects of the situation. He knew his strength was in short guns and thus close action, while his adversary's strength was the long guns. By anchoring in Cumberland Bay, the Plattsburgh's harbor, he forced a close engagement and reduced his exposure to prolonged long gun barrages 
And, in the most insightful manner, he knew his ships would probably take a beating from the mass of confiance, so he anchored with spring cables that would allow him to stay in place, but, when needed, turn his ships completely to expose their undamaged batteries. He arranged his ships on a north-south axis with one side facing the enemy and the other protected from the enemy by proximity to the shore and shallow water and the northernmost vessel close to the land so the enemy could not go around his line of battle. Captain Downey planned his attack on McDonough for September 10th but had to postpone it for a day because there was no wind. The next morning, a gentle breeze blew from the north, so he took his entire squadron south, rounded Cumberland Head, and sailed into Plattsburgh Harbor to engage the waiting American fleet. The beginning of the battle was announced when a ball from an early exchange hit the hen coop on the Saratoga's deck, freeing a cock that alighted and crowed loudly, giving cause for the Americans to rally and let out a cheer. Immediately afterward, McDonough himself fired the first shot from a 24-pounder long gun that penetrated the hull of the oncoming Confiance near its house hall, raking the gun deck and killing or wounding several men. But the Confiance's cool-headed Captain Downey did not return fire until he was ready. On calm water, he carefully took aim and then broadsided the Saratoga with 16 long 24s each double-shotted. The ship was so shaken, most of the crew was thrown to the deck, 40 of whom fell dead or wounded. Downey was soon killed and McDonough twice was knocked unconscious, first when hit in the head by a falling spar, and then when hit in the face by the flying head of a seaman decapitated by a cannonball. The battle was intense up and down the line and two ships drifted out of action, the HM Sloop of War Chubb and the US Sloop of War Preble but McDonough in the Saratoga was bearing the brunt of the action. Twice his ship had been set afire by hotshot and gradually all of his engaged guns were silenced. But for his foresight, the battle would have been over. However, he sprung the cables and brought a complete new undamaged battery into action as did his other ships. The British tried the same but were unable. After two and a half hours of battle, the British struck but their gunboats escaped into the lake. None of the large ships on either side had masts left that could carry canvas and the hulls were cut up and taking on water. The Saratoga had 55 shot holes in her hull while the Confiance had 105 and the smaller vessels suffered similarly. The Americans lost 58 killed and depending on the definition had up to 140 wounded. The British numbers were also high although not exactly known because the gunboats scattered, but thought to be upwards of 60 killed and up to 300 wounded. Although British General Prevost had told Captain Downey he would attack Plattsburgh as soon as the naval action began in the harbor, he was delayed and had no sooner sent his advance troops forward than he learned of Downey's defeat, whereupon he ordered a hasty retreat to Canada. This did not sit well with his men nor his superiors, for he subsequently was relieved of command. But that was the last major action on the northern border. Unbeknown to any of them, talks were underway in Belgium that eight weeks later would result in the Treaty of Ghent, signed on Christmas Eve, 1814. This is a production of the American Society of Marine Artists, the nation's leading professional, educational, not-for-profit marine art organization made possible with the assistance of the United States Navy, United States Marines, and the United States Coast Guard in conjunction with other leading national and international institutions, museums, and historical societies.